The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising flood waters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707 764 2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers. I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. That's kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll free 833-4-KMD-LAW. That's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be. Because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. I'm really excited about today's show. Uh, Michael Dare, uh, a really cool guy. I've only talked to him for a couple of minutes, but I love him already. I got to tell you, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I really do. He doesn't know. I, I, I'll tell him in a second, but you know, he's down at Hemp Fest right now. So he's out there doing one of these Hemp Fests up there in Seattle, and uh, he's telling me how he's putting the flags up and stuff. And he doesn't know that I was one of the old yippies from New York City back in the 70s. And I, we used to put oh, on... Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With National Marijuana <laughs> Day. <laughs> so does that mean you know Paul Krasner? I've met Paul Krasner, yeah. We're not great friends, but I've met him a few times. I was a teenager back in those days, so I met him a few times. But Dana, yeah, right. Yeah, Dana B. But he is definitely one, he is one of my mentors. I mean, he's still uh, he lives in Desert Hot Springs. I lived in Desert Hot Springs for a while. We are we are old pals, and uh, I've definitely learned how to be a crazy journalist from him. Very cool. I got to get him on the show now that you mention it. You know, because oh, I've had I'm AJ. Sure right he would be glad to talk to you. Well, I will. Uh, I will put you in contact. Oh, Michael, I love you already. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Who is Michael Dare? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of answers to that. People keep telling me I need to write it all down, and uh, I have, but it's just not in the right order. Uh, I was born in Beverly Hills, and uh, I went to Beverly Hills High School with Richard Dreyfus, and uh, then I went to LACC with Mark Hamill, studied acting. I moved to New York. I got into the actor's studio. I studied with Lee Strasberg. I did five years of theater in Los Angeles in, in the 70s. Uh, and then that somehow mutated into journalism. I became the, the film critic for the LA Weekly for 10 years. And uh, because of that, I ended up writing for Daily Variety and uh, Billboard and uh, the National Lampoon. And uh, uh, I had a good solid 20 years as a Hollywood 
therapist, uh, which I used to great advantage. Uh, I could interview anybody uh, I wanted. Uh, a typical day in my life was I would see the very first screening of a movie called Blood Simple. And the publicist would say, uh, would you like to meet the guys who made this? And I would say, sure. And I'd get to spend the day with the Cohen brothers. Uh, this was an excellent life uh, for quite a while. And uh, there's a long story about how uh, I got thrown out of Hollywood, which actually got turned into a movie of the week by CBS. My other claim to fame, yes, Hollywood made a movie about me. Scott Bakula played me. So picture that <laughs> with this voice. <laughs> What's the movie? It was on CBS like uh, 10 years, 20 years ago. And, and what's it called? Anniversary is coming up. It was called The Bachelor's Baby. Ooh. Uh, so, uh, and is the story of the custody battle from hell, which uh, we can skip. Uh, watch the movie. Uh, there's, but then I moved, I moved on, and uh, now I live in Seattle. I've been here about 10 years, and I am one of the uh, core staff that puts on the Seattle Hemp Fest, which is the world's foremost protestable. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people gathering in the park to listen to rock and roll and hear uh, hear speeches and commit civil disobedience and it's been going on for 25 years this is our, our 25th anniversary and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun it is six stages of non-stop music in the park for for three days you know I gotta tell you <laughs> I can relate to what you're saying because I get to do this radio show and I get to talk to the most interesting people in the world and it, nothing can nothing can top that. You know what I mean? Isn't it great? And well, what was cool, uh, particularly, I mean, you have to go out and find the people. In my case, I, it was just like I'd go to a movie, and then afterwards, the publicist would say, you know, well, if you liked it, you want to meet them, and it, well, yeah. Uh, and so all of, it was to, it was this nonstop parade of uh, people I wanted to meet. If I, you know, if you want to learn how to make movies, yeah, interview Robert Altman, interview John Carpenter, interview, uh, you know, et cetera. I have a giant list and stacks and stacks of tapes of all the people I interviewed. Oh, oh man, I'd like to get a hold of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, some of them, yeah, I've been slowly but surely going through them. It's like my, my one with Doug Adams. I particularly am, am happy with it's full. Of, it's like I never bothered. I didn't transcribe it because my newspaper said no. But now listening back to it, it's like, oh my god, this is like, this is the man who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I have his voice talking to me. <laughs> hey, what do you think? It's like, Maybe we should talk about you playing that stuff on the air. Well, some of it you might, some of it you might want. I've been yeah. slowly but surely digitizing it. For instance, I did a lot. My favorite director was Hal Ashby, and when he discovered this, he contacted me at the paper, and we became pals, and I taped a bunch of our conversations. And those tapes are now the backbone of a new documentary coming out on Hal Ashby, uh, which isn't, which, you know, I, I don't know the release. They're st still in the process of editing, but. Uh, uh, yeah, it's cool to see my old stuff reemerge in, in new formats. <laughs> yeah, man, but still, listen, you got a pretty cool life right now today because if you're able to go down there and spend like a whole week down there, no, are you sleeping out in a tent at the, the Hemp Fest? No, I, well, you uh, one of the weird things that we have to do is is kind of uh, is deal with the people who are living in the park and yeah. letting them know that they have to move because we're bringing in this festival. Now, I live uh, on the outskirts of downtown Seattle. I can walk to the, this park. Is a, it's a one-hour walk from where I live. Uh, so, uh, but for me, you know, it's no, it's no hardship at all. Oh my God. This is the opposite of a hardship. This is the most beautiful place on earth. If you could see what I'm seeing right now, you would, it would, it would blow your mind. I mean, uh, it's no wonder this festival has lasted as long as it has. Cause it's just an excuse to come and spend time in Myrtle Edwards park. Okay. It's called Myrtle Edwards park. It's in Seattle. And, and when does this, it's, uh, on the, 
people go to the waterfront. So, I mean, it's where the Ferris wheel is and the ferries. But if you just keep walking north along the waterfront, it becomes the Seattle Art Museum Sculpture Park. At the end, which be, is the end of Myrtle Edwards Park, and it just becomes this long, winding, thin, kind of snake like park that goes up the coast for another, another mile and a half. And this starting Friday and through Sunday, it's going to be full of hundreds of booths selling not just hemp related items, but a lot of hemp related items. Uh, plus six stages. And the, the most interesting thing to me is experts from around the world who really understand what hemp can do to save the planet and what medical marijuana can do to, to help all of us. And uh, once a year, they gather together and at the symposium and, and uh, we all learn from each other. Backstage at symposium is my favorite place on earth. That's where I'd take you. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I haven't smoked. I haven't smoked in about 25 years, I guess. It's been a long... You know what? I can't say that. I smoked, I guess it was 1990. Uh, this kid that worked for me pulled out some pot and he was trying to roll it up. I said, hey, give me that. Give me that. I rolled it up in two seconds. <laughs> and I smoked so bad. Right. But otherwise, not that much. Now, now, this is starting on the 19th. August 19th. Uh, what time? Uh... 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And then till till six. God, I should have the I should have those numbers in my head, shouldn't I? Yeah, you should. Uh, <laughs> well, because I'm here, I, my hours are different from everyone else's. So it's like it's I'm here on Monday. It doesn't start till Thursday, and it's going to go on till Sunday. To be in an empty park, it'll go on till Sunday. <laughs> yes. And, and what kind of bands you got and, playing? Anybody we'd recognize? Uh, it's oh man. <sighs> Why am I not prepared for this question? Well, you know what? Don't uh, worry about it. Let me see. Uh, yes, it was just published, and I uh, but I don't have the schedule in front of me. It's mainly local bands because, for one thing, we don't pay. It's an all volunteer organization. Uh, the stages are built by volunteers, and the bands are volunteers. Uh, that's, I would say, the primary reason why we don't have you know major national bands because you know they at least want to be put up in a hotel <laughs> well don't don't worry about it when you get a chance to shoot me a message on facebook tell me who's going to be playing all the times and stuff send it to me because i do another show after this live on friday night so we'll have plenty of time to promote oh. it yeah yeah okay and I, and I gotta say that the fun part of it is bopping from stage to stage and hearing lots and lots of different kinds of music that you've never heard before uh, that's my favorite part of the festival I like hearing I'd rather hear a band that I never heard of that's great than a band that I knew was going to be great that's great I hear you <laughs> I remember one time when I was a kid, we had Country Joe and the Fish come down and play at, uh, at the march up uh, 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 Fifth Avenue in New York City from Washington Square Park up to Central Park. Uh, now, Michael, the reason why I, I first got a hold of you and I heard about you, I love you now, but the, the, when I first heard about you, um, it was about the story about John Belushi. Um, yes. <laughs> well, well, get us started on that. How'd you, what was it called? Uh, the uh, Dr. Primo? What was this thing called? Well, there was <laughs> Captain it Primo. It eventually led to Captain Primo's. But what yeah. you have to know is, you know, the way John entered my life, which was just, it's the way a lot of people have entered my life. But this was, this was definitely the most extreme. I mean, I was just at home. I don't know what I was doing. I was typing. I was doing whatever I normally do. And there's a knock at the door and I open it and there's John Belushi. And now you have to put this in, in space and time. This is uh, Animal House had just come out. Uh, he was still on Saturday Night Live. Uh, 1941 hadn't happened yet. Uh, if you would ask me, who's the one person you want to meet? Uh, I would have said John Belushi. And he was just like standing there. And he said, are you Michael there? And I said, yeah. And he said, can I come in? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then he immediately just, he tells me this story. Uh, that was the very first day of the shooting of 1941. Uh, all the other stuff he'd done had been low budget. You know, Saturday Night Live is low budget. Uh, 19, uh, uh, Animal House was this low budget 
film. This was his first day on the set of a major Hollywood multi-million dollar Steven Spielberg picture where he was the star. It was like, it was the most amazing day of his life. And at some point, I had a friend who worked on the film too. At some point, my friend walked up to him and just smoked a joint with him. And that was the moment that ended up changing my life because John Belushi had never had Cincinnati. Uh, it's hard to believe, but you know, it, it's, you know, from Chicago, from New York, all that he got was the, the, the standard pot that people had, you know, brown, dirty, full of sticks and seeds and stems. And he had never had bright, fresh, sticky, gooey, pungent, delicious, green California Cincinnati. And he just, he smoked this joint and grabbed my friend by the lapels and pinned him to the wall and said, where did you get that? <laughs> and well, my friend uh, did not, g gave him my phone number and my address. And he ignored my phone number and just drove straight to my house and banged on the door. And he just knew that if the pot came from this address, whoever opened the door, <laughs> if they saw him, they'd let him in. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he had that, he had that ability. Uh, so I whipped out my bomb. We started getting high. He noticed I had a record collection and he starts going through it and playing records and singing along with them. And I have a piano. I start playing and he picks up a guitar and starts playing. It, it's like, hours go by we just have we become immediate pals and then at some he says you you, you got more of that pot right and i said well i have i have some and, and he reaches into his pocket and he hands me a wad of hundred dollar bills that is three inches thick and he just gives it to me and says you take what you need out of that and go get some more of this and, and then he turns his back on me and goes through my records. And that's still one of the most amazing things that ever done to me. Not, you know, has anybody ever trusted you with that amount of cash? That was crazy. Yeah, but you want to know what? Uh, I remember I was from New York back in those days. And we had, like you said, we had that cheap commercial Colombian pot. And the first time I smoked right. sense, I had the same reaction, man. The first time I smoked some good exotic pot, it, it, you know, it, it was like a whole new world. Right, right. It, yeah. It's just, uh, he said, no, this is it. Yeah. It's like, I cannot believe this has existed all this time. And I didn't know. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I pulled off a few bills, gave it back to him. And, you know, he hung around. He said, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, and he eventually left. And uh, I went to And I said, you won't believe what happened. Guess who showed up? So anyway, here's 200. Let me get, let me get some more of that pot. And my, my dealer says, really? You think he might want some hash or, you know, how about mushrooms? I think they might have, I tell you what. And he just proceeded. He said, how about if I just front you all this? And I went, well, okay. I don't know what'll happen, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to turn you down. It's me all this stuff. And the next day at the end of shooting, uh, John shows up with Dan Eckert. And uh, the same thing happens. They go through my record collection. We play, play music, and they buy me out. Everything. And the next day, John shows up with someone else. And the next day, with someone else. And it became... You know, I'm sure they were put... I'm sure he had a beautiful hotel room and the limo, but he found somebody's living room that he could hang out in and get high and make... And it, it was a home, and yeah. it was a home to him. And that, that was it. It became his home for the shooting of 1941 because what happened was everyone he brought by would go, holy fuck. <laughs> can I can, can I get something? Can I come by sometime? Sure. Well, yes, of course you can. And 
And I would say, yeah. And within six months, I had to move to a bigger house with a driveway that let in, you know, people could pull up through a side uh, entrance. And I had a menu and I had employees and it was called Captain Primo's. And it was kind of like what modern pot stores are like. Uh, I had, except that into the mix, I also had quaaludes and mushrooms and coke and uh, and hash. And well, hash and hash oil are, uh, have, have, <laughs> are available, but it was, uh, I was a full service deli. What it was, was it was the very first place. Used to be when you did a drug deal, you would just hand someone 20 bucks and get a bag. In this case, people would show up with, you know, and they'd go, oh, give me $20 of Hawaiian and uh, let's see, two quaaludes and let's see, a gram of hash and uh, oh, let's no, and they, they would, they, they would, no one had ever done this before. So I became very popular very fast. Well, well, let me ask a question. Because uh, if you're selling grams for like 10 bucks a gram, you must have had a huge traffic coming in and out of your house all day long. Well, you know, and eventually that's what got me busted is the police sitting outside seeing all this traffic. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yes, but it was also, I was next, when I eventually moved to the bigger house that was the Primo Mansion, it was like, uh, I would say the traffic, there was nothing unusual about it. It was a busy area. Uh, uh, and I, you know, the traffic is once again, there were never drug dealers that wanted you to hang out at their place. You know, you, the whole idea was to get in and get out fast. Right. In this case, the idea was to come in and much like a speakeasy or the Algonquin club, the idea was to put it on the table, share it with everyone else, hang out, pick up a guitar, go to the piano. Uh, see who shows up next. You know, I'm sure. De- you know, deals were made because they they, they met each other uh, at my place, and I let the business grow exponentially because I never got paranoid. Right. You know, I would. You know, it. I normally, you know, new people showing up is kind of a bad thing, but in my case, it was people I literally recognized. You know, so I'd knock the door, open it up. It's Gee, it's the president of no a, a studio who I know. It's like, well, I know, you know. Oh, it's Laverne and Shirley. Okay, Laverne, you can come in. Shirley, you you leave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one more Mark, question, Mindy, quick. Okay, Mark, you come in. Mindy, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> one more question, real quick. One more, because now 1941 was considered to be like a big flop. Do you ever feel responsible for that? Well, <laughs> there are those who have blamed the film on massive amounts of cocaine. Yeah, I've heard that well, too. I, you know, yeah, I'd say a small percentage of that was mine. <laughs> yes, but that isn't the problem with that movie. And if you want, I can tell you the real story of what happened, which I got because I was backstage. Okay, yeah, uh, you have time for that. You want to hear it? We can fill two hours if you want. You're great uh, if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, this is a great story. Uh, all right. Steven Spielberg made Jaws. It was not supposed to be the biggest movie of all time, right? So because the studio knew that, they gave him uh, uh, 10% of gross. Mm. Right? They never give anybody 10% of gross. They gave it to him because they knew that the film was never going to gross anything. Uh, or, Oh, no, 10% of net, right. Uh, they knew that it was never going to get anything. So then when the film made $50 million and it was the headline in all the newspapers, well, Spielberg knew that they, they owed him $5 million. It was very clear. Uh, so he, he went to their office. He had a script in his hand of the next movie he wanted to make, which was an early version of 1941. And he went uh, to the studio and, you know, and they said, they pulled out a briefcase with a million dollars cash in it and gave it to him and said, take this, or you can sue us for the other four million, or we'll just make whatever script that is you've got in your hand right there. Really? And we, you know, right. And he took the deal. 
And he didn't give them the script writers and said, add 50 million to this. <laughs> and they sat down and they added a Ferris wheel that goes off the end of a pier and they added a cl- uh, house that falls off the uh, side of a cliff when the door slams and they added a chase through a paint factory and they added a plane crashing in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard. All of that shit only existed so Spielberg could make just get his money back. Okay. <laughs> He realized, that, that, that you, he realized that you make your money during the making of the movie gotcha. and you can't expect to get your credits. So he deliberately just went way overboard. I mean, that plane crash on Hollywood Boulevard had 12 cameras running. And after it was done once, that was it. And he just said, let's do it again. Oh, wow. And he did it. And he did it three times. I was there. I was helping keeping people awake. <laughs> while, he, <laughs> while he kept crashing this plane and actually crashing an actual plane onto the set see, see that makes sense now hey, but one thing I gotta remind you though is watch your, watch your language no, uh, no adult words no uh, cursing okay <laughs> alright I'm sorry no, I guess it. you'll have to beat me I'll yeah. try to keep myself under control so now back to Belushi then okay uh uh, okay, so the, the the first part of my relationship with him was all based around that film. It was like uh, I was his hangout, and I knew all the people in the film, and I was there on the set all the time. Yeah, uh, and then uh, then a weird thing happened. Okay, I was Captain Primo before I became the film critic for the Weekly, so I made a transition from that into being a journalist. Which was very weird for me because I'd be reviewing movies of people who were my ex clients. <laughs> okay. That was weird. <laughs> uh, and okay, so I run into him here and there, but I'm no longer Captain Primo, right? And but I'm still tied in, I still know all those people, right. I still have all those connections. Uh, and I'm on a gig, uh, strangely enough, the first time I came to Seattle. Uh, I was Tom Robbins, and I were working on a screenplay. And we heard over the radio that John had died. And, oh, was that you? No. Uh, another call, which I am turning off. There we go. I turned it down. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, yeah. Okay. Uh... So, um, you were saying you were in the car with, the, with Tom Robbins and you heard he died. I was in Seattle, yes. I was uh, in La Conner, Washington, actually, when the two of us heard over the radio that John had died. And I was like, you know, I was very upset. And, um, you know, I, 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 that, I told Tom Robbins that whole story. Uh, but. Oh, we just lost the uh, Skype connection uh, with uh, Captain Primo. Or formerly Captain Primo, I should call him. But I'll just call him right back. Okay, hi. Fascinating stuff. Hey, guys, don't forget Hempfest coming up uh, in Seattle at uh, Myrtle Park, I think it's called. Uh, right by that Ferris wheel on the uh, 19th, Friday the 19th. Starts at 10 a.m. on Friday. And now a word from our sponsors. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. 
A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising flood waters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at Aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. You call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Hey, Michael Dare. your message for Martin Scorsese. <laughs> well, he's got one of those funny... Uh, answer machines so let me just try and get him in back one more time it's great stuff man he's got this story it takes a whole leap into uh bob woodward so i definitely got to introduce him to len Claudney. hi you've reached michael uh, there please what what happened there just a second ago it was uh martin scorsese and now it's a different recording unless he was being a wise guy and uh, was making a funny answer machine voice. Might have to uh, turn off uh, the recording. Hello? Hey, Michael, how are you? Hi, I'm sorry about that. I just got another call, and when I pressed, I guess I disconnected both of them. I don't sweat it. We're fine. So you were saying you were talking about... Well, where was I? Right when you were talking about you were with Tom Robbins, and you found out that uh, John had passed. <clears throat> okay. The essence of what it, the essence of what I discovered in my personal I'm I'm getting feedback, okay. Now it stopped. Okay. I was hearing my own voice back. Uh, the essence of what I discovered was that the drugs that killed John Belushi came from the LAPD evidence locker. That it was all a a a they were trying to bust John Belushi that uh, Kathy Smith had had uh, made that she would uh, uh, keep the LAPD posted as to what was going on in the room that she was getting John high and she reported back that uh, well Robin Williams had dropped by and Robert De Niro had dropped by and whoever her contact was at the LAPD got a little bit greedy at that point and thought to themselves well gee it would be better if we could make a bigger bust uh, he asked uh, Kathy Smith if you know if there was any chance they were coming back she said well yes and could there be any other big stars coming by and she said yes and she was told, well, just, you know, keep getting John high until any other stars show up. And when they do, give us a call and we'll make a, a bigger bust. And so she kept getting John high until he died. And then she called them and said, hey, guess what? Your shit just killed John Belushi. And they said, don't move. And they showed up and they told her to leave, come back in an hour. Uh, they cleaned up the room and... Uh, waited somewhere until uh, I believe it was the maid or so, I don't remember who found the body but they waited for someone else to, to find the body uh, there are like most conspiracy theories uh, this one is uh, interesting in the fact that uh, it's proven by, by in some ways lack of evidence uh, if you listen to the entire you don't know, have to listen to it if you read the transcription of uh, Kathy Smith's questioning by the LAPD when she's eventually arrested. Uh, for some reason, they literally never ask the question, where do the drugs come from? Uh, it's a question that never comes up at any point. Uh, and they didn't ask because they knew where it came from. It, it came from them. Uh, and... 
Uh, I believe that if they hadn't gotten piggy, but at any point they could have just arrested John Belushi. Uh, we knew what was going on in there. Uh, they were just waiting, hoping to make a, a bigger bust uh, because they knew that uh, he was getting visits from other stars. So this Kathy Smith uh, was an informant? She was like a full-time informant or she was working off a case? What was going on with that? I wouldn't say full-time, but she had, she had, she had already, yes, she had a, a case already in the works. She was uh, specifically given drugs from the LAPD evidence locker to, to promote, you know, a relationship with John Belushi or with the interests of getting him busted. How did she and get? She, and, how did she meet Belushi? That I don't. Okay, uh, that I don't know. I was there. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't around. Right. And I, I never met her or never had any contact with her. I mean, the, I'm. I, what I would, I don't even remember what the story was in the book, uh, in the many books, in the many different versions of this story that has come out. No one has really just. Uh, I don't know how how you can uh, prove at this point where the drugs came from. Let me ask you a question, Mike. Now, when you started looking into this story to find out, hey, what happened to my friend John? So you started asking your old buddies and stuff like that. How many people came back right. to you with the same story? Was it just one person or several people? It was, It was. well, two specific. It was one person who said they heard it from someone who put me on the phone with them. Mm. Uh, and it was someone who was... Uh, uh, intimately involved someone who uh, told me that they were in bed with the police officer and overheard the conversations uh, between him and Kathy Smith okay okay and you're still in touch with that person today or they're gone uh, mm, yeah they're gone okay I would have no way of, of contacting them. And I don't even remember their name. Right. It was one of those, you know, I was in a cave somewhere and a phone call and so, and he hit the, the speaker and suddenly I was talking to someone who was scared and telling me this story. Uh, so, no, I have no way of verifying it other than I did, in fact, have that conversation. What about Kathy Smith? Whatever happened to her? Did she, was she, what was she charged with after this? Well, she was, she was charged with something. She did go to jail for a short time and got out. Uh, she has, to the best of my knowledge, she has never, you know, admitted where the drugs came from. Right. Or, or this whole thing about that she was an informant. She definitely wouldn't admit that. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, but she, she had a trip. Now, the weird... Yeah. The weird part of it for me, I mean, we have to get into Bob Woodward a little bit. I know. Because at some point, my phone rings and it's, hi, this is Bob Woodward. Uh, yeah, sure it is. Uh, and he says, okay, uh, call information. Ask for the number of the Washington Post. Call that number. Ask for me. I went, oh, okay. And he hung up. And I called information, asked for the number of the Washington Post, got it, asked for him, and got the same guy on the phone. That's how he does business. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I knew I was actually talking to that guy in all the president's men, you know, because that's who I was picturing at the time, certainly. This guy was one of my heroes. He hadn't gone off the deep end yet. <laughs> And uh, so he tells me that he's writing this book and that Kathy, that, uh, you know, Judy Belushi had asked him to do it. And I knew Judy and trusted her. And, you know, I, I said, you know, he said that he knew that I knew John and that if I admitted to things that I would just be, you know, part of this whole gang, everybody got high with John. So it was no big deal for me to admit it, too. And I wasn't sure about that. So I uh, I called Kathy back and talked to her, and she, you know, she said, "No, I, you know, I trust him, and everybody's telling him the truth." Please, and so based upon her advice, uh, I told Bob Woodward the entire story I just told you. All right. Uh, now there were two parts to this. Oh, well, actually, but I told it in a different order. First, I told him. I'm thinking to myself, I'm deep throat, 
right? Deep Throat said, follow the money. In this case, I'm saying to him, please follow the drugs. Please, whatever you're doing here, just find out where the drugs came from. Can you do that? Come on, Bob Woodward, please. <laughs> because I believe the drugs came from. He said, well, how do you know that? And then I told him the whole backstory of how I knew John and the life and death of, you know, of my, my Captain Primo and my drug dealing days. Uh, but the only I only use that as verification for the fact that I I knew the people who would know where the drugs came from. Uh, but in any case, uh, he he says that's great. I'm I'm coming into town like next week. We'll have lunch. Blah blah blah. You know. Uh, so I'm all set. I have an appointment with him and. Uh, he, of course, stands me up. And I kind of forget about it until the book comes out. And, like, he trash. He not only trashes me, he kind of blames me. He makes it seem like John, the way the book is structured, uh, John's Maluka's life is just going along great until he moves to Hollywood and does 1941 and falls in with Michael Dare. Oh, boy. Uh, it's just, you know, it was... It was really weird, and absolutely no mention of where the of any even hint of the conspiracy that that John was being set up. Uh, doesn't even ask the question: Where do the drugs come from? And I'm just, you know, uh, I'm of course pissed off because this, you know, this doesn't make me look good when I'm, you know, I'm I'm an up and coming film critic I had there were gigs that I lost because uh, suddenly the, an excerpt from Wired was printed as the cover story in the Herald Examiner uh, the uh, oh man it's, it's really hard to relive that particular moment but I got a weird sense of uh, reprisal in once again it's someone who I can't name or even where it happened. I'm at a Hollywood party somewhere, and I'm introduced to someone. And they go, oh, Michael Dare. Are you the Michael Dare who was in Wired? And I said, yes, I was. And she said, oh, my God, I, I worked on that book. I went, really? And uh, this was a woman. She said, yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, a research assistant for Bob Woodard. And I said, really? Well, do you know why he didn't use my story? And she said, yes. I said, oh, well, okay, tell me. She said, the day that he was coming out to interview you, instead, he uh, to have lunch with you, instead he had lunch with Daryl Gates. Who was the police and commissioner? Who was the <laughs> chief of police yeah. of the LAPD. She said, until Bob Woodward had lunch with Daryl Gates, yours was the story we were telling Hello, are you still there? I'm still here. Very interesting, because, you know, Daryl Gates is, 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 I guess... He was he, <laughs> he was the head of the LAPD at the time, yeah. not one of my heroes. And I would suspect that, uh, I mean, that there's a conversation that I would like to hear. What did Daryl Gates say to Bob Woodward that made him change the actual story of the book? I mean, the way this woman told it to me was... She told me that they had verified my version of events. That they had absolutely, they had three to four other people who had told the same story. So, yes, my story, that's what the story of the book was going to be about. The corruption of the LAPD right. and how their greed is what killed John Belushi. Until, whatever that day was, and Bob Woodward met Daryl Gates instead of me, and that's the book that came out. Uh, you might want to ask him. <laughs> well, well, you, know, you know who I got to put you in touch with? I'm going to put you in touch with a, an author named Len Kaladny, who wrote a book called Silent Coup. Have you ever heard of that? The, no, but the name rings a bell. Is he a journalist? Yes. I mean, he, also, he wrote another okay. book called 40 Years of War, 40 Year War. Uh, from Obama to uh, from from Nixon to Obama, something like that. Uh, in fact, I have it right here in front of me. Just sent me a copy. Uh, now, listen, this guy has done some work on Bob Woodward that's going to blow your mind. Uh, he 
because he got into a little beef with Woodward and he went into this whole lifetime of investigating Woodward's life, uh, how he got all these jobs at these different newspapers and stuff. And one of the things he came right. up with, yeah, is, yeah, oh, and this <laughs> Woodward's not the hero we thought he was, guy. <laughs> okay, you know that for a fact. Right. But Woodward, yeah, I mean, Woodward this makes no sense. It didn't seem to me that he was, you know, why did he turn into a drug warrior? Why did he turn John Belushi into a poster child in our completely corrupt, what is it, $30 billion a year drug war that's every penny is going down the tubes, achieving absolutely nothing? Oh, my God. And yeah, there's, <laughs> we can blame Bob Woodward, I guess. Well, Wood Woodward worked at the White House. He worked in the Nixon White House before right. Watergate. <laughs> okay, you know, and, and he was right. involved. In, he was involved in a lot, in, in pretty much handling the whole Watergate thing. He got, he's got uh, Butterfield. Uh, he, he's told him about Butterfield. It, it really, really great work. I'll, I'll send you this guy's information in an interview that I did with him. Now you're saying too that now this book, this Woodward book, came up too in your. I went through a custody battle. In fact, I'm still going through one. Uh, Ten years uh, I've been doing this. Uh, my kid lives with me now. She's uh, 16. She's going to be 16 in November. She only got a couple of years to go through with uh, more to go through. But now they use this book. They pulled it out in your custody litigation. Yes, they did. Uh, and, you know, I learned a lot about how court tactics work. I mean, certainly the attorney knew that they, you can't just introduce a book into evidence. Uh, and uh, the judge told them that. Uh and the, the judge said, you may not introduce that book unless you have the author here to verify whatever's in it. And then they threw in, and besides, you know, I have this book at home. So it's like message delivered. Right. It's like, you know, that when the judge gets home, he's going to, he's going to look up my name and read all that shit about my being Captain Primo, uh, which, you know, the only reason I ended up with custody of my son is because uh, the mother's story was even worse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, if she had been a normal person with a normal job, she absolutely would have gotten custody. Uh, so looking back, uh, the, the tragic death of Belushi, uh, and it could have been avoided. Do you think that it could have been avoided in so many different ways? Yeah. I blame every drug death, not on the drug, but on the war on drugs. You know, uh, it's uh, unless it was suicide. If someone's deliberately killing themselves, then, you know, the war on drugs has nothing to do with it. They Someone just chose to use drugs to kill themselves. But, you know, you take someone, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman. I do not oh. think. He committed suicide. He didn't. He was having, to, there was no indication that he was in that direction. He just wanted to get high. Why did he die? Because he took a drug that didn't have a label on it. Because it wasn't, it didn't say, it wasn't in a bubble pop up thing that said, here's one dose, hmm. pop. Because it wasn't, because it's not regulated. He didn't mean to kill himself. It was an accidental overdose that only happened because the war on drugs is preventing labels on heroin, labels on speed, labels, accurate labels on all these goddamn drugs. And that's what will prevent death. But then let me ask a question then, Michael. What do you think about, because they're, they're pushing all this Oxycontin on us and stuff like that, all these prescription painkillers that pretty much get people addicted to that stuff and then they wind up on street heroin. Uh, you, you, think, you, know, you think that's a good path to go down? Well, no, absolutely not. And yeah. I think that medical marijuana is very much a, an answer to that. And I, I, and I think getting away from the pharmaceutical industry and into plants uh, is a... Uh, is another smart tactic. Uh, no, I am not for oxycontin, but I am for poppies. Okay. <laughs> I think you should be able to in your backyard and make tea out of it. Is your pain in exactly the same way that that oxycontin does? Only there's no participation of a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a relationship between you and the healing plants. 
that we should all have in our garden, which should include the poppy, uh, uh, cannabis, uh, uh, even the coca plant. Uh, I am not recommending that anybody smoke crack or do cocaine, but making tea out of coca leaves? I'm afraid that's the exact... It it would put Tums and Alka-Seltzer out of business because it's a local anesthetic. And as soon as it gets in your stomach, you have no pain. You you make a... a, you, you, You take coca leaves and mix them with water and spray it into your nose. And first time I used cocaine was in the... 60s when I broke my nose and my doctor gave me a spray bottle of cocaine water to ease the pain of my broken nose. Why the hell is that illegal? Yeah, you know what, David Brenner, yeah, David Brenner had migraines and he, he used to have a little spray bottle with cocaine that he had to, he was still getting until he, up until he died. And they let him have it. I guess he had some kind of special. Okay, well, yeah, but, but you see what I'm saying? There is, yeah. there is a rational approach that can be used toward, towards all of these drugs and it has to do with removing the profit motive from medicine. And also, you know, removing any restrictions any uh, for growing any plant i don't see how any plant how can they make mushrooms illegal i don't care what kind of mushrooms they are they grow wherever dog shit (laughs) how can that possibly be illegal uh you know so yeah i think that it's a slippery slope removing marijuana from schedule one because i don't think there's such thing as a schedule one drug it simply there's no such thing as a drug that has no use the entire category is completely uh goes against common sense you know michael that reminds me of another mutual friend of ours uh billy hayes from midnight express i guess (laughs) uh he's a very good friend He, uh, he he changed my life a lot well okay well he started out I guess he probably started out as a primo customer. I mean, oh, someone really? brought him by. And they have to have gone, you know, Billy, Billy, it's like I could have saved you all that trouble if you just got your ass from me. <laughs> well, you know who I had on the show? I, I had the show. Um, who was that guy? The hippie mafia guy, um, Stratton, Richard Stratton. I had him on the show, too. And uh, what do you call right. it? And I says, yeah, I, I told Billy. I says, come on, you were in New York. You couldn't go down to yippie headquarters and get to get the hash over there. What's wrong with you? Right. <laughs> you know? It was the same stuff. But but here's the, the weird part is that I told him the story of my custody battle. Yeah. And he says to me, wait a minute. That is worse than my story. Uh, but, wait, no. That, there's no way what happened to me is worse than five years in a Turkish prison. And he says to me, at least I was guilty. <laughs> you know, it's like I did what they charged me with. In my case, well, if you don't know how the, the system works for, for child abuse, is step one, take away the child. Step two, prove the abuse happened. So you're you're in this horrible, you know, catch twenty two. It's like trying to prove a negative in order to get your kid back. It's the reverse of how the justice system normally works. So that's why he decided, well, we got to make a movie about that. And he and I wrote The Bachelor's Baby, uh, following his lead because he learned how to write docu pics from Oliver Stone. Right, Oliver Stone. And Billy Hayes together uh, wrote Midnight Express. Although Oliver Stone is the only one who got the credit for Midnight Express, Billy was there with him. Yeah, that's an incredible story. Yeah, he lives here in Vegas now, uh, Billy Hayes. And uh, my my custody thing, you know, was a nightmare as well. You know, and they they cleaned me out. They cleaned out every every penny that I had. (laughs) They just size you up and they take every dime you got. You know. Yeah, really. Yeah. It is. Uh, uh, I was lucky that I didn't have anything or I would have. Uh, <laughs> they would have taken it. Michael Dare, thank you so much. I, got, I definitely got to check out Bachelor's Baby. I'm going to see if I can find that today on uh, Put Lock or something like that and see if I can watch it. Okay. You know what? I have just digitized it. Okay. And it will, and I have it, uh, it will be appearing on YouTube very soon along with my commentary. Uh, 
20 years looking back on what it's like to have Hollywood turn your life into a movie of the week. That's an experience. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. Michael Dare, we're out of time. They changed all kinds of things. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friend, okay? All right, this was fun. I will, uh, we will be in contact later. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. And now a word from our sponsors. Hey, guys, if you like the show and you want to show your support, uh, check out the Opperman Report Patreon. Uh, you can go there and become a member uh, for $3 a month. We have all the shows that you hear Monday through Friday on AM, FM Radio. We have all those shows, but we cut out the ads. So you can hear that content ad-free. Uh, there's a $5 section where we put up all the old uh, member section shows are going up over there. And then there's a $10 section where we have brand new content. Eight hours of exclusive content per month uh, goes up there in the $10 section. But listen, I put up a lot of free stuff, too. We put up documents, court documents, photographs, announcements. So you should make the Opperman Report Patreon a, a stop. You should stop there once a day and check out what's going on over there. That's Opperman Report Patreon. Before Epstein was the Franklin cover-up. Before that, the Finders. And long before that, the Cleveland Street Scandal. Pedogate Primer is a concise intro and overview of a growing child abuse epidemic worldwide. It features shocking instances of institutionalized and organizational pedophilia throughout history. Churches, cults, the world of arts and entertainment, the government, NGOs, charities, and major corporations are all complicit or culprits in many instances. Pedogate Primer delves into material that for many may seem like the stuff of conspiracy theories. For this reason, the book draws on academic resources, declassified documents, and other reliable sources, and steers clear of conjecture. Such shocking true stories need no embellishment. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at Aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. That's kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll free 833-4-KMD-LAW. That's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be because the team at kmdlaw.com are battle tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to kmdlaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMD Law. Hey, if you have something you want to promote, like a business or a website, you've got a big event coming up, uh, consider advertising on the Opperman Report. Uh, we have excellent advertising rates for you. We're on KCAA on uh, three different frequencies on AM, FM in California, KSHP, uh, 1400 AM, uh, Nevada, uh, WWPR in Florida, the Tampa Bay area, 1490 AM, and also WWNN, which is on the east coast of Florida, all the way from Miami up to Port Bay, 175 miles of I-95. 
Uh, the advertising rates are very affordable. Uh, once your ad goes up and we play the show on the podcast and on the YouTube channel, uh, those ads stay up there forever. And then we play repeats every single night of classic Opperman Report shows. And your new ads will be inserted into those repeats that play every single night. So uh, the, the, the saturation is incredible and the rates are very affordable. Contact me at oppermanreport at gmail.com.